Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. I am shooting from the Lugnuts facility. Uh, what you see behind me are two of the cars that uh, I've been working on. Um, one is a 1986 Jaguar XJ SC Cabriolet, and the other is a 1989 Mercedes-Benz uh, 420 SEL, and that's the W126 body. So these are both uh, luxury cars from the 80s. They would have both had long production runs. The mechanical components of the XJS were shared with the sedan, the, XJ, uh, the XJ12, um, and the mechanical components of the W126S class uh, were shared with the R107 Roadster. Okay, so they both had uh, a sports car version. A more uh, exact comparison would be if I had the uh, Mercedes SL Roadster to compare to the XJS, but these are the two cars that I own. Um, the Mercedes I bought about 10 years ago and when we were, my wife and I were having our first child, I wanted the safest, um, uh, you know, the, the safest and the roomiest sedan uh, that, uh, that I could think of. And that led me to a very low mileage uh, 420 SL that I got in New Jersey from a guy named Dean Limbach, who now is something fairly popular on Bring a Trailer, selling extremely uh, well-kept and well-presented uh, older Mercedes. Uh, the Jaguar came to me uh, from a friend. Uh, it was her father's uh, car who passed away and uh, she had it in storage for quite some time and then I revived it. So I've been doing the maintenance on the Mercedes and in fact I've been driving a 124 or 126 Mercedes for 20 years as daily drivers. Um, I've had numerous um, 124s and 126s, the coupes, the convertibles um, and, the, and the sedans. And for the Jaguar, um, I, I guess I have a family history of Jaguar. I was just about born in a 2.4 Jaguar sedan. I just restored an E-Type uh, Series 3. And this is uh, one of two XJSs that I have that I've been recommissioning. So um, I've been maintaining both cars and uh, that's just brought about kind of an interest in how the maintenance is the same and what, what things are the same in both cars, what are different what gives Mercedes the reputation of being the best car in the world and what gives the Jaguar the unfortunate reputation of uh, being mechanically uh, needy. Um, what is fair and what isn't and what are the things about the design of the cars, the intrinsic, intrinsic design uh, of each car and the philosophies between each car which have an effect on the maintenance. Okay, okay so I've pop the bonnets on both cars and uh, exposing the engine. So let's go and do a tour of the powertrains of these two cars, um, explaining the similarities and the differences and the design objectives that the engineers had when designing each car. All right, so first with the Mercedes. Well, the Mercedes wins uh, the contest for access. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, second position of the hood. Uh, you can do, you can click a couple little tabs there in the corner and make it go completely vertical. And for the Jag, it opens the other way. And uh, you know, what is that, a 30 degree angle? And so, <laughs> so <laughs> Mercedes certainly is, uh, is a lot easier to get at. Okay. So looking at this engine here, or the construction, um, this is a very straightforward car and very well engineered um, with the uh, aim of easy servicing. Um, uh, there's no question about that. And it's a car that's engineered for uh, a, long, uh, a long life cycle and, uh, and durability. Um, there's two bulkheads, and so you can see that all the electrical components, the batteries, the, uh, the computer, the, um, the relays, etc., the fuse box, are all sandwiched in between these bulkheads uh, where they are protected from the heat of the engine. Okay, so that, that is a really good idea. Um, we have a 90 degree V8, and I'll go into the V angle um, with quite a bit of detail. So when you're designing an engine, um, and a, you know, a four stroke engine in a certain configuration, there's going to be an ideal V angle uh, to uh, 
um, that dictate the smoothness of the engine by controlling the primary second and secondary forces on the crankshaft, okay? So you can make engines in other V angles, but they present quite a bit more problems with smoothness. So you're, you're gonna find that just about every V8 engine is a 90 degree V8. You'll also find that just about every V12 is a 60 degree V12. Well, why does that matter? Well, in, you can see this V8 here and uh, you know each of the different uh, cam covers. And with a 90 degree V8, there's quite a bit of room in the center. There's room enough for this big air cleaner. And we've got the uh, Bosch CIS fuel injection system, you know, housed neatly in the, uh, in the center of the V. Um, we've got the, you know, the ancillary components running off the belts, power steering, the distributor, uh, etc. alternators down there, okay? Um, when we have a 60 degree, or sorry, uh, uh, a 90 degree V8, uh, and we have a single overhead cam, well, everything's fairly accessible. I just changed the valve cover gaskets in this car today, and doing both took me about, uh, well, about an hour, probably an hour and a half with an oil change. Um, I have to do that, or I had to do that on my other XJS, and my Jag mechanic, who's been working on these engines for all, basically his whole life, told me it's a 12-hour job on the XJS to do the same job as what I just did in an hour, okay? And that's not because, uh, we'll get into the reasons for that, but it has to do with the layout and the angle of the V and so on, okay? So this car is extremely easy. You know, move some wires and vacuum hoses out of the way and pull the valve covers off and change them, no problem. And then we can see with the Mercedes that everything is really routed nicely and there is a lot of space in the engine bay. Now, this same engine is in the SL series, the R107, and that is a little bit of a tighter fit. So it's a, perhaps unfair to compare the, the coupe version of the Jag to the sedan version of the Mercedes. Although when I think in an XJ12, there's no more room than the XJS, but in, but in the SL, it's quite a, quite a bit tighter on the side of the engine for sure, okay? But with this sedan, um, you know, the spark plugs give easy access. Uh, the, um, you know, with the hood, with the hood vertical like that, you can, you, it's easy to uh, get in there and uh, everything is really intelligently laid out and well rooted and well clipped down. So, uh, you know, all the wiring harnesses and so on are neatly arranged and there's very few, uh, very few sort of stray wires in this, uh, in this engine bay. I guess there's a couple up front there. Um, you know, and then, you know, that's the distributor. That's not the distributor cap. That's the cover for the distributor cap. And if you take that off, then you get to the, then you get to the distributor cap and it's not clipped on like some older British cars. There's three screws or four screws that hold it in. And anyway, it's very substantial, very weather tight, very well engineered and, uh, you know, designed to really give a lifetime of service. Okay. So uh, with that's the, the design, you know, the parameters for this car. The engine, this is a 420 engine. It's, it's about 200 horsepower in North America, 4.2 liter. This is back when the nomenclature for Mercedes made sense. There was also a 5.6 liter version of this engine. And in North America, it had, I think, 230 horsepower, 200 and 238 maybe, something like that. Um, and in Europe, I think the last ones may have had 300 horsepower, but we never, but we never got that. Um, that was in an era where European cars weren't catalyzed and the North American ones were, okay? So this engine and the compression ratio, I think runs between, you know, nine and 10 for different models. I think one's 8.8. .8. Um, so it's a fairly low stress, you know, this is a 4.2 liter engine with 200, 200 horsepower. So it's a fairly lazy engine, well muffled, it's quiet. There's nothing exceptional about, about the engine. It's quiet and it's smooth and it does its job and it has good torque characteristics. Um, and it's, it's easy to service and it's designed to last a long time. All right, so let's go to the Jag now. Um, so we've got uh, a V12 and the only you know, V configuration that makes sense with a V12 
is 60 degree. So 60 degrees doesn't give you a lot of space in between the Vs, okay? So for any car that doesn't have a big hood scoop, which virtually includes any front-engined V12 passenger car, uh, like the Ferrari racing cars are different, um, the intake has to go on the side of the engine and that's why you get these runners that go from you know the center of the engine inside the v over top i mean that's the cam cover there over top of the engine and then we get the air cleaners on the side okay so what this means is that um if the valve cover leaks which they all will uh, you can't just unbolt it. You've got to take the whole air cleaner assembly off as well. So that is one reason why a v any V12 uh, is going to be quite a bit more costly to maintain uh, than a, a 90 degree V8 is because just, just the, not just the size of the engine, but the way it has to be packaged to accommodate the 60 degree V angle and the orientation of the, um, of the intake. Now on the Jag, it, it's even a little bit more complicated than that because you don't just have the valve cover sitting on the head. Uh, you've got an actual camshaft block that houses the seven main bearings for the uh, camshaft and it sits on the head and then the valve cover sits on top of that. So you've kind of got an extra piece in there. Um, that can also leak. Now, um, so to get to do the job uh, properly, you have to remove uh, the intake, okay? Then remove the valve cover, then remove the camshafts, then remove the camshaft block, the camshaft carrier, then replace the gaskets, and then put it all together. And that's why I can do that job on the, in the Mercedes in one hour, and that's why a professional will take 12 hours to do it on a Jag in 12. But is the Jag not well designed because it takes so long to change the gaskets on the intake? No, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a well-engineered engine. Uh, it is, you know, seven main bearings for the crankshaft, seven bearings for each camshaft. It has rigidity that uh, is built in with these uh, uh, lots of bearings and these camshaft blocks. The 60 degree V12 gives the ideal smoothness. And uh, you know, it's a beautiful design. It just isn't a design that the, you know, the first priority of it wasn't ease of servicing. The first priority was performance and smoothness. With that comes more complexity. With the complexity comes more labor to do the maintenance it's not because it's a, a not a well-designed engine uh in fact it's it's a gorgeous engine it won you know the 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 origins of it date to 1956 with the d-type uh two six-cylinder engines on a common crankcase and then it was redesigned in the early 70s by harry monday and walter hassan um, and then it uh, was in production for you know more than 20 years and they probably made, you know, 100,000 of them, and it wound up winning Le Mans in 1988 and 1990. So it's a fantastic engine. Um, but it, it's not, it, they didn't design it for the ease of maintenance. Now, the other thing that when they were designing this engine in, for the E-Type in the XJ12, you know, it was in the late 60s, and uh, I think it came out in 1971. And fuel consumption wasn't, wasn't the priority back then. Um, this was before the OPEC oil crisis in 1973, and gas was cheap and plentiful. And uh, designing engines for the uh, for the best mileage, you know, what, it wasn't it wasn't the, the top of the list uh, uh, for the designers. And the the V12 engine had lots of great characteristics, and it was efficient at uh, full throttle, which means which uh, which makes it a really great racing engine. But the original V12 engine wasn't great at part throttle, which is what most people drive at, and was terribly thirsty. So you'd, you know, you, you, you'd, you'd, maybe you wouldn't even get 10 miles per gallon with the original XJS. Okay, 
So that became more of a problem as the, uh, you know, uh, uh, when, it, when it was put in the XJS in the, in the mid-70s and carrying on to the 80s. And Jaguar felt the need to, uh, you know, do, do something about that to increase the efficiency of the engine. At that time, there was a Swiss engineer named Michael May who was shopping around a stratified charge uh, combustion chamber idea that he wanted the man manufacturer to pick up. Now this would, we would have started, we, we saw the Honda CVCC engine from the Civic uh, in the, I think, 76. They came out with that stratified charge engine and were able to meet emission controls without a catalyst. So the idea of a stratified charge uh, giving more complete burn and allowing a higher compression ratio and greater efficiency had been around for some time. And Michael May took that concept with what he called a, a fireball combustion chamber and uh, shopped it around. He found some interest, but it was picked up by Jaguar, whose, whose engine, the V12, um, responded really well to that design uh, because that design specifically helped at part throttle which is where the Jaguar V12 needed to help. Okay, so Jaguar adopted this stratified charge engine for 1981 and came out with the Jaguar XJS HE and it had an extremely high compression ratio, 12.5 to one in Europe, 11.5 to one uh, in North America. Uh, the Mercedes is running eight or nine to one, depending on, on what market it was in. So a much higher, a much higher compression ratio. And that uh, created a bunch of other engineering challenges, which goes some way to explaining why this engine bay is so complicated, okay? So Mercedes didn't really worry about that with this engine um, uh, because they, uh, they could get away with a lower compression ratio. Um, at the end of the day, the Jaguar 5.3 engine put out about 300 horsepower in Europe and about 265 in North America and the top of the line Mercedes 117 engine, which that is a 4.2 liter version, but they had a 5.6 as well in the 560 SEL. That was 238 horsepower in North America uh, from five and a half liters or 5.6 liters. Uh, so it was a good 30 horsepower down on the Jag that had a smaller engine. Um, the Mercedes 5.6, I think went on to produce up to 300 horsepower in the final years in Europe, and the Jag went up to produce, I think, 320 horsepower, but it could be tuned, tuned for a lot more. But it, in North America, if you had a top of the line 560 SEL, it had 238 horsepower with 5.6 liters, and with the Jag, you got uh, 5.3 liters with 265 horsepower, okay? So the Jaguar was, uh, had higher specific horsepower, higher overall horsepower, and it had better fuel economy as well, okay? So um, the, at the expense of some added complexity. So with the smoothness, the power, uh, and the fuel consumption, were all better in the Jag, okay? But the engine bay is a lot more complicated. Now, the re part of the reasons for that are that the cylinder pressures are very high. With the, in, the, in this engine, 11 and a half to one compression ratio, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, it needed a, a really, really powerful spark to ignite the stratified charge, okay? And so that means you need, you have a coil over there and you've got another coil that lives over there uh, giving the spark. Also another byproduct of the compression ratio and the uh, cylinder pressure was that uh, the vacuum advance system needed to be um, totally recalibrated. Uh, because this particular engine, you know, had different, substantially different needs at idle when it was warming up for uh, emission controls to part throttle to full throttle. And so the advance on the ignition had to change considerably. And that was tough to do. 
Uh, today, you can do it all with electronics and map out the engine fully. But back then in 1981, when they came out with it, the technology uh, didn't exist. And so you've got a huge network of vacuum tubes, valves, and timers with different vacuum profiles that uh, are engaged on uh, temperature and time and uh, control the uh, vacuum uh, control the advance of the engine so that there's a lot of hoses and a lot of parts to that you know maybe half a dozen different parts and a whole lot of hoses that control that so that adds to the complexity of the engine bay but it's there for a reason and the reason is to get a complete burn on the on the combustion and that's what gives you the better fuel economy okay so Again, there is a benefit to it. There's an engineering reason to it, uh, but there is complexity and maintenance that goes along with that as well. The distributor itself would have a hard time uh, at, with a V12 engine at 6,500 RPM. Um, that's, I think that's why some of the Ferraris have two distributors, one for each bank. Um, Jaguar's solution was to go with a new Lucas Opus electronic ignition system and keep in mind these were in their infancy in the 80s now this luke i mean lucas has a terrible reputation but this system was developed on f1 cars and proven reliable in the 1970s and basically it is instead of uh points and uh, uh on the distributor making contact with the what you have is you have a magnet which is so it's a, a breakerless or a contactless ignition system and basically it's just a magnet that spins around so it's a very advanced um uh ignition system but but a reliable one i think they had to replace it uh or sorry put it in a different place because of the engine heat uh but that uh, it, that was one of the first instances of fully electronic ignition okay now later in the xjs's life it did get a fully electronic uh, dme system from Mari uh, magnetti marielli uh and i think that came in around 1990 if i'm not i'm not mistaken um it has some of its own issues but uh but the he version and the early xjs's they had to sort of work around a bunch of engineering challenges that were a result of the um, of a high RPM V12 road car engine with a really high compression ratio. And I, th I think they did a good job of that with what they had. Um, you know, 30 years later or 40 years later, it can be a challenge to work on one, especially if, if you're getting something that, that's been, that's a basket case or has a lot of deferred maintenance or has not been worked on by somebody who understands and knows the cars very well. So the diagnostics can be challenging. But if you get one that's looked after properly by a JAG mechanic who is familiar with the cars, you don't need to be too scared of it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a well-designed engine and they're well-designed systems. If there's one fault of it, you know, you've just got a lot of extra wires that are kind of unshielded and that any one of those you know, can cause diagnostic problems if they break that are pretty hard to trace. Um, if we look at the Mercedes, for instance, it has, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have as many of wires like that and they're all clipped down and shielded and sheathed a little bit better than the uh, XJS. Also, there's some more airflow in the engine compartment, so the engine compartment doesn't get as hot. So. Uh, the, you know, for sure the Mercedes is going to be the easier car to maintain by a long shot, but the Jaguar is, is a nicer engine. It, it's smoother. It's, it's, uh, the, the car is quieter. It has uh, excellent torque and a great high RPM, uh, rev range. And, uh, it's a lovely thing. And so, you know, if you want a V12, they are a little bit special, but they do, but there is a, a lot more complexity with them, uh, with the layout necessary to put them in a passenger car and these early XJSs uh, without a, a full uh, uh, digital engine management system have a lot of little valves and solenoids in them. Uh, but 
you know, they're, they're relatively easy to understand if you break it into systems. And the car doesn't have expensive black boxes, which just blow up. And, and uh, you know, those can be incredibly mystifying too later on. So let's go now to the suspension of the cars. And uh, we'll put these both on a lift and we'll see what uh, is underneath them because there's also more maintenance with a Jaguar uh, with the suspension systems and brakes than there is with a Mercedes. Again, there's a benefit associated with that as well, but let's have a closer look. Okay, so let's take a look underneath these cars. Let's start with the Mercedes and we'll go from the, the back of the car. Uh, there is nothing too unusual in here at all. Um, but what I wanted to focus on was the way the suspension is isolated from the monocoque. Okay, so you have the suspension arm here, the axles, spring, uh, there's the fuel pump, the differential. And you can see that it's got, you know, substantial bushes where the suspension arm meets the monocoque, okay? And you can see the upper spring mounts there. And you can see, um, you know, the other bushes, which, you know, the shock absorber bushes, which are fairly standard, I would say fairly ordinary. Um, in the front of the car, again, you've got, uh, you know, decent sized bushes, which, which buffer the suspension um, from the uh, uh, from the rest of the car. Sorry, it's, this is this car wasn't rusty when I got it, but it's had a couple Alberta winners. Um, okay, so it, it, I would say this is fairly conventional. Okay, so uh, there is you know you can see that you know there is a big rubber bush there, which. Uh, isolates some of the front suspension from the monocoque. But let's go to the Jag and have a look at this. So first of all, there's no brake discs because on the, on the wheel because they're inboard. Um, so, and then the differential is carried on this subframe. Two coilover shocks per corner on the rear um, and then the subframe unbolts here and here, and the whole rear end gets let down. And you have to take the exhaust out, and then this whole piece gets lowered down. Now, up here, you can see those big rubber bushes, um, which isolate the subframe from the monocoque. Uh, so you've got all the all the driveline pieces separated uh, from the um, uh, from the uh, passenger compartment, and you've got twice as many coilovers in the rear, two per wheel instead of one per wheel, and then that whole subframe is isolated. Um, and we can see at the front it's a little bit more conventional. Um, but we still see, you know, we can see the buffers isolating the suspension and the monocoque, which are bigger in the Jaguar. Also, we have uh, the subframe. Uh, so to get at the engine, you can't replace any of the gaskets, maybe the transmission gasket, without taking the subframe and the front suspension off. So if you want to get in there, and do your oil pan gasket, you have to take the front suspension off, okay? Now, that design is smoother. That design is a little bit quieter. The Jaguar, I mean, it's like driving a Rolls Royce, and it might even be more refined and quieter than a Silver Shadow, the period Rolls Royce, okay? Um, the, the, the penalty for that is that if you wanna replace the gas, you know, the oil pan gasket on the Mercedes, you just all undo those, you know, 20 bolts and the thing pops off. It's not the case on this car, okay? You have to take the whole front suspension off. So that's another instance where, you know, you might, you know, the Jag gets its reputation for having um, high maintenance, but 
the maintenance is part and parcel of a design that had different objectives and different priorities than the Mercedes. The Mercedes was designed to give a long service life and have easy maintenance. Um, the Mercedes makes quite a bit of noise inside. It's not a quiet cabin and you feel and hear, uh, you know, all the bumps from the suspension. So it's not a particularly luxury, luxurious car when it comes to, when it comes to that. The Jaguar is, and their priorities for the suspension were, you know, something, first of all, that was a little bit more sporty, and second, uh, quietness and refinement, and uh, a secondary component, or secondary priority, was the ease of maintenance, so that's what you get. So, you know, to drive these cars back to back, you really notice that, and it's a big difference. Um, you know, for the classic car owner, you know, obviously there's going to be more people who, you know, would, you know, want to deal with an older Mercedes, either the sedan or the, or the, the SL rather than the Jag. But the Jag is a lovely thing. And those engineering solutions uh, give a much quieter ride and much less, uh, you know, uh, NVH. Um, uh, you know, going over bumps and stuff, the engine's smoother. So with a Jaguar, you know, we've got, you know, we've got a car that is more powerful, faster, uses less gas, is quieter, smoother, with more refinement. So you could make a very strong argument for saying that the Jaguar is the better designed car than the Mercedes. And that might be sort of shocking to some people, but if you look at those engineering solutions and the objectives. Um, the, ja the Jaguar meets, meets them and it, 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 they did a fantastic job with the car. Um, the XJS was in production for I think 20 or 21 years. And then the platform went on to the basis for the XK8 and also the Aston Martin. So the design work that was done by the British engineers in the 70s and 80s was first class. There's no question about it. Um, the Mercedes is, you know, in terms of build quality, in terms of durability, in terms of, in terms of maintenance needs, uh, you know, it's in a whole different league than the Jag. I mean, that, I've driven that Mercedes for 10 years with, with our family in it and, and through the winters as well. Um, and the Jag just wouldn't survive that. It just, it just wouldn't. I think that, that the way I'd look at it is that the Jag is a luxury item. Um, the Mercedes, I wouldn't say is. The priorities of that car are, like I said, um, safety and durability and longevity and service life and so on. It's not particularly luxurious. It's just a competent, durable machine. The Jag, you know, it's like an expensive leather couch. It doesn't wear as well as, as, the, as the cheaper ones, even though you pay more for it. But that isn't to say that you don't get value from the Jag. Um, so, you know, for an occasional use classic that doesn't get driven all year round, that you don't put 20,000 kilometers a year on, you know, I, I think it's a great buy. And they made a lot of XJSs and Mercedes too. They made almost 900,000 of the 126 sedans and the, and the coupes. Um, and they made 115,000 of the, of the XJSs. Um, in terms of the SL, it also had a really long production life, 18 years, and uh, I'd have to look it up, but I'm sure they made over 100,000 of those too. Um, so they're plentiful, um, and you can find, and a, a lot of them go to good homes, so you can find good examples, uh, like, like the ones I have. Um, and then with, uh, uh, albeit some increased maintenance, uh, you know, and maybe they need a little bit more of a sympathetic owner, um, I think they're fantastic uh, classic cars, both of them. And, uh, you know, in period, you might have seen both of these cars in the same garage. And uh, for the person who wants a couple of great classics, I mean, both these cars together wouldn't cost as much as a, a really scruffy air-cooled Porsche. And so I think they both have their merits. I don't think the Jag deserves all the kind of bad press that it gets. Um, and, uh, you know, I think... Uh, both cars have their place and, and I like both of them for different reasons. Okay, so with that, uh, thanks for viewing. Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada.
and the lug nuts facility.